Welcome back to the Persistence Project, where we talk about th- all things strength training, from mindset to max effort. I'm your host, Rob Allen. I'm a strength coach and a multiplier powerlifter, and this podcast is all about finding out why my peers, other coaches, athletes, and practitioners within the strength space do what they do. This podcast is proudly brought to you by my awesome sponsors, Jacked and Juiced Apparel, who provide awesome training apparel for all your heavy lifting needs, Hunter Performance Physio. If you are local to the Hunter area, they are some of the best physios you will find for heavy lifting. And East Coast Supplements in Dubbo. And a special shout out to those guys because they just welcomed a baby girl, Delilah, into the world. So congratulations to them. Today, my guest is Nick Andreessen. Nick is a strength and conditioning coach. He runs NZ Athletics with his wife, M. He is powerlifter with a best total of 767.5 in the 140 kilo class. He's a strength and conditioning coach with the Maitland Pickers rugby league team here in the Hunter Valley. And he is a former colleague of mine from Hunter Strength and Performance. He's now working at New Sport. New Sport. New Sport at the Forum here in Newcastle and doing great things with team athletes. And Nick, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Rob. I you appreciate are. it. This is something that we've been speaking about for a little <coughs> while. Uh, and I've been an avid follower of this podcast uh, since the start of the year. You and I spoke about you wanting to start this late last year, early we this year. Yep. Um, we had many of conversation about that during our training sessions. And I just want to say off the bat, I'm really proud of what you've done. I've, Thanks, I've loved the episode so far. I'm, I'm grateful to be here. And I think you're doing a really great job. So thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. Appreciate that. <laughs> you uh, you did have a podcast that's a bit on a, a bit of a hiatus at the moment. It is on a hiatus at the moment, yeah. So um, just doing a little bit of a reshuffle at the moment in terms of, of how that looks and yep. um, if it comes back, how it's going to come back, just in terms of um, the, the time that I have available to give in that space at the moment isn't as as it once was. Yep. Uh, and I don't want to put something out there that's not to the to the quality that I'm happy with. Sure. And I want to do... Um, you know, the people that, that did take the time to listen a disservice by just throwing something together haphazardly. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're taking a little bit of a break uh, and, and using the time to have a few conversations here and there about what that might look like when it comes back. So. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with Nick's podcast, it's called Bars Loaded Podcast. Plenty of episodes, lots of great information to check out. So that's on YouTube and Spotify as well. Yeah. So check it out and follow him on Instagram. I'll put that all in the show notes, but it's a great podcast and hopefully it does come back. Thank you. It'll be, it'll be back in some capacity. Yeah, just what it looks like. Who knows? So lots of things happening for you, but where I want to start, like I always want to start, is what originally got you into the gym. Okay, so I did preface this uh, by coming on by saying myself is not my favourite topic. Yeah. Um, so anyone that has listened to me speak on, uh, on Bars Loaded will know that I'm not afraid to speak. And I, I can speak in volumes uh, for very long periods of time. But um, when Rob asked me to come on here, my, myself is not my favourite topic. So um, <coughs> I'll do my best to, to speak about myself. But if it feels awkward, uh, that's, that's why. Because <laughs> it is. <laughs> um, but yeah, so what, what drew me to the gym? Um, I guess uh, from an early age, I identified as an athlete. Uh, I, I played sport. I played every sport that I could. Uh, and I, I, f- I felt like I was better at playing sport than I was at anything else, um, which when I say I identified as an athlete, I guess that's what I mean. Um, I, I quickly fell in love with rugby league as, as my primary sport and, and started playing that as much as I could um, for both club and, and school teams. Um, but being the biggest kid... My age, uh, I'm 6'6 six, six now and uh, I'm, I'm not quite as heavy as I once was when I was powerlifting, but um, I'm still quite a big person and I've always been a big person. Um, so when I was playing under 10s, under 11s and un- under 12s, etc., cetera, um, I was twice the size of everyone else. So naturally, the, the teams above me in age groups, when they were short of players, they would say, let's take the big kid <laughs> and we'll play him. <coughs> Uh, Mm -hmm. in our team to fill up some numbers, um, which was great. And I loved that. But I quickly realised that that just because I was bigger than everyone else, um, I I wasn't necessarily stronger than everyone else, Mm -hmm. especially um, when I was playing two or three years up in age group. The the strength discrepancy was quite large. Um, So 
I wanted to I wanted to be good. I wanted to play in the older age groups because I felt like it was a great opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, but I and I didn't want to just get belted every week essentially. So um, I begged one of my best mates uh, to come to the gym with me before school every day. And so um, we decided to to join the gym at 12 years old. Uh, and that gym that we joined is actually still operating here in the Hunter. It's called Genetics at Warners Bay. Oh, yeah. It's one of the, the OG gyms <coughs> at the, the bottom of the hill. Uh, and at the time it was owned by a competitive bodybuilder and the the crowd at the at the time of the morning that we trained, which was was early before school, mm-hmm. was predominantly him and his mates who were also competitive bodybuilders. Uh, and so, this was when I was twelve years old. I'm thirty eight now, so it's quite a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the, the bodybuilding <coughs> scene was was huge then, and and these guys were quite literally jacked out of their mind they were the <laughs> biggest humans that i think i've ever seen in my life and yeah. there was a whole crew of them so yeah, me and my mate would go in and we we would just mess around and do some sort of training that mm-hmm. you, know, you couldn't really call it training it was like we would just do leg extensions for an hour because once we got on a machine we felt comfortable there <laughs> and didn't want to go somewhere else where we felt uncomfortable yeah um but we, we went consistently, which I think caught the attention of, of the guys. And, and mm-hmm. throughout this, the, the first couple of months, my mate ended up dropping off and, and I didn't drop off and I kept going on my own. And after about six months, one of the, the bigger guys came over to me and he said, hey, you've been coming here for a while. I said, yeah, this, my name's Nick. I play football. I don't want to be the weakest guy on the football team. Um, so this is why I'm training. Um, you're huge and please do don't hurt me, <laughs> essentially. Um, and he was like, no, you, you've been training quite consistently, but you're doing everything wrong. You yeah. train with us now. Yeah. And I was like, cool. <laughs> um, so from that moment, every morning I trained with those guys um, and I just trained like a bodybuilder. Yeah. Um, so that was kind of my first, I guess, step into the gym um, through, through wanting to be better at sport, mm. essentially. Mm-hmm. Did you, once you made that transition and you started making some progress, because no doubt you would have made progress pretty quickly then, yeah. did it translate to the field? Yeah, it did. Yeah, I, I, I definitely <coughs> became, you know, less easy to dominate. Mm-hmm. Um, and the thing, the thing is with football, um, with me, is I was quite big, like I said. So I got a lot, lot of opportunities early just based on my size. Yeah. Um, and like I wanted to capitalize on that, so I wanted to also be a physically capable to handle the the rep teams and et cetera that I was getting put into. So the gym definitely helped, and and the more it helped, the more I liked it. But then obviously, as a result of training around that age, I started to look better. Mm-hmm. I started to get a little bit more attention for girls, which also wasn't a terrible thing. Yeah. Um. So it all kind of fed into this this kind of thing where I just associated positive. Uh, positive with gym mm-hmm. and so the, the gym became from a very early age something that was just a non-negotiable yeah. in my life and to be quite honest I've never stopped training ever since then so yeah. however long that's been 34 years uh, 24 years yeah 24 years so yeah it's a fair stint it's a fair stint yeah. in the gym and and to still love it it's good yeah, I mean, there's been times that I haven't loved it, oh, obviously, yeah. um, and I think we all experience that. But yeah. for the most part, that whole that whole time, I've I have I have loved it. Yeah. Um, so you took football to a pretty decent level as a teenager. Yeah, fairly decent. I mean, it's it's definitely not something that I love talking about just because I don't want to be that 38 year old guy that was like when I was a kid. I used to bench 400. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so um, football was was my first love and and will always be my first love um in sport and and prior to gym and everything like that and you know i did i was able to take that to a a fairly high level for Mm -hmm. my age um (coughs) played in some some grand finals for the local junior team that i played for played in a, a decent amount of junior rep teams um played for the the local the local NRL juniors here in Newcastle um, had had a few contracts with them, and and that kind of through that time as well led 
me a little bit more towards training a little bit more athletically mm-hmm. and, and not so much training like a bodybuilder, but more so, you know, the, the typical strength and conditioning type of training that you would you would do to that would see a little bit more crossover into into the the athletic realm yeah um so that was kind of my first exposure to that um i had a a really great weightlifting coach um when i was at the at the knights juniors and his name was adam tripatch shout out adam i know he's still around he's actually the head snc coach at hunter sports high now i believe I'm um, working with the, the athletes over there and he was fantastic. He was an Olympic weightlifter, <coughs> super knowledgeable, um, really cool guy. And, and he kind of was a catalyst for me moving more towards that athletic style of training as well mm. and starting to incorporate a little bit more of the Olympic lifting and, and the yeah. velocity based stuff outside of just pure bodybuilding training. Yeah. Um, so that was a really cool time as well. Um, and that was in, in my late teens. Yep. Which is interesting now, and we'll get to this a bit later, but because you've transitioned away, in, or transitioned into more athletic stuff in your work now. Yeah. And people are like, oh, Nick's really into the athletic stuff. It's like, no, he's always been into the athletic stuff. Yeah, it's kind of, it is cool. And, we, and I think if we get the opportunity to <coughs> later in this conversation, I think it would be a, a really nice tie-in because mm-hmm. you're right, people kind of look at, the the training that i'm doing now Mm -hmm. um which no doubt we'll get to um the reasons why i'm personally doing that now but also the the content that then is coming from that that i'm putting on instagram and a lot of people are are saying oh like you're moving into this kind of more athletic realm and it's for me it, it almost feels like not necessarily a step back to that, mm-hmm. but more so like I'm stepping forward and I'm bringing what I what I learned here in in the early years, um, what I moved into for a big chunk of, of time in my adult life, which was was purely strength training and, mm-hmm. and powerlifting, and I'm I'm kind of finding this really nice balance of the two, and and moving forward with all of the skills that I've used and and not just pigeonholing into one aspect. Yeah. Um, which has been very refreshing. So late teens, getting more into athletic training and learning more about training because you went into being a PT pretty early too. I did, yeah. So uh, around that time, um, late teens, you know, I, I'd done a little bit of work with Adam, like I mentioned, in, in the night system. Um, and from a, from... As long as I can remember, I've been a Broncos supporter. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't talk to me about this year. If you want, we can talk about last year all your <laughs> life. It was a much better year. You won't get any um, arguments from me. I don't know. <laughs> I know who the Broncos are, but... Let's leave it at that. Yeah, let's, let's go, go look them up. Um, <laughs> it's been a tough year, but I, I, I always loved the Broncos and I always felt like... I, I felt <coughs> a, a draw towards Queensland mm-hmm. um, because I was such an avid Broncos supporter... I then became a Queensland supporter in the state of origin and I'm from New South Wales. I know it's, it's, it's taboo, but Traitorous. I, <laughs> I liked the players, I liked the club, I liked the culture. I, I just felt a connection towards Queensland. Sure. So when the opportunity arose um, to go to Queensland to play football, I took that opportunity mm-hmm. in my late teens uh, and I moved up to Queensland um, to play in the Queensland Cup up there for a couple of years. And while I was doing that, um, in 2006, 2005, 2006, um, I actually enrolled in the Australian Institute of Fitness Brisbane campus yep. and did my personal training certificates, my Cert 3 and 4 yep. there. This was before they were online. Yeah. So this was, a, I think it was 12-ish months um, at, at campus. I would yep. have to drive into Brisbane City and, and go to the campus and sit down in a classroom and, yep. and do the practical stuff in the gym that they had there and, yep. and then get signed off at the end of it as you, you have your certificate for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I did that in 2006. I was 18 and I instantly started training people mm-hmm. straight away. Yep. So uh, I went out on my own straight away as a, as a sole trader um, and coached people PT PT people, I'll make that distinction. It wasn't coaching at the time; it was it was purely personal training. Mm-hmm. Um, and I used to give half an hour sessions out of the Novotel Hotel in Brisbane City. Yeah. Um, so 
it was a it was a tough slog, uh, and it, but it definitely served me well later in life. I would say because when you have to go and stand at Brisbane train station in peak hour mm-hmm. and with flyers and say are you interested in health and fitness to every single person that walks past? And if someone shows an inkling of interest, just try and have a conversation with them. Um, And what I would do was the the train station in Brisbane city, which was really, it was like the the place to be when people were coming and going from work. So I would go down there. It was literally just under the Novotel hotel. So I'd go down there, I'd be in my PT uniform and I would, I would try and get someone interested. And if they were, I would say, do you know what? I have time right now. Let's go up to the gym. I'll show you around. We can do a quick session. And then when you come back down, you can catch the next train home and, and be out of all of this hustle and bustle. Yeah. You can you can beat the crowd essentially and work on your fitness at the same time. Yeah. And so that was a, that was a tough slog. Yeah. Uh, and I, I did that for a little while. Were you good at that? To begin with, or was it no awful? I was horrible at that <laughs> to begin with. Because um, I, knowing you now, you're very good at 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 um co- not coercion. Um, what's the word I'm <laughs> looking for? It is <laughs> that's, coercion, but that's positive coercion. <laughs> positive <hopefully>. coercion. <laughs> yeah. It is not in a negative sense, but you're good at convincing people. You're good at selling. Yeah. You're particularly good at selling yourself, and obviously you've built that over time. So what yeah. did it look like when you first started doing it? Yeah, well, that just comes through repetition. Yeah. Um, like anything, right? Like no one's really, well, some people are, but they're the naturals. Mm. But uh, most people are not good at anything the first time they try. Yeah. And I really like to instill that in my coaching as well. Is like, you know, if you want to get really, really good at something, you just have to suck at it. Yeah. And you have to be okay with not being the best to start with. Mm-hmm. And then just... Do it over and over and over and over again and just try and make slow progress. Yep. Stick with it long enough and you will get better. Yep. It, you know, it's inevitable. If you do something 10,000 times, you're not going to be as bad as it as when you started. Yeah. It, it, and if you are, at least you tried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know? The very least. Yeah, the very least. But you know, I, I think you would have to be very unique to be able to do something that many times and be, and be bad at it. Yep. So you know, I was in a position where... Uh, I, I didn't. I wasn't really doing anything else other than playing football. Yep. Um, I didn't have another job, um, and I was getting paid to play at the time, so that was nice, and I had a little bit of a cushion. Um, so, uh, and, and I was terrible at it, but I knew that I wanted to do it mm-hmm. um, because training for me was just something that I loved so much that. And, and I saw the direct benefit of doing it in so many ways in my life. You know, yep. I was a shy kid. <clears throat> and I forced myself to not be shy because I was told at a young age that the shy kids don't make it in sports. Um, so if you want to make it, don't be shy. Um, and I wanted to make it, so I just pretended that I wasn't shy. Uh, and I, I saw that training helped with that. It gave me confidence because I knew that if I was working on myself physically, it was also kind of... And, and I know training's not therapy, but it was also kind of fortifying me mentally at the yeah. same time. It, it yeah. was making me realize that I could do hard things and it was okay that it was hard. Like mm-hmm. you, you're going to survive. And that was a really cool lesson. Um, I met a lot of friends through the gym, so I got confidence through that. But then, yeah, back to your question. No, I was terrible at it. Mm-hmm. I, I was horrible and I scared a lot of people away tra- probably <laughs> trying to be like over-enthusiastic or, or mumbling through my sentences. <clears throat> but yeah. I really wanted to make a go of it. Um, and I had I'd taken the time and, and gone out on a limb and, and you know, got a meeting with the CEO of, of, the, of the Novotel in Brisbane and, yeah. and negotiated that I could use this space. And I was like, well, I'm not going to do that and then just not coach people out of there so Mm. i wanted to have a go and before long i started getting some people say yeah i'll come up and have a look yeah and then the more people that did that the more confident i got and then eventually i i had a full roster i didn't have to do that anymore which was great and then i realized if i just service my clients really well and they don't leave i'll never have to do that again Mm mm-hmm you know, if if I service my clients really well, they don't leave, and then they tell their friends and family that this guy's really good. You should coach him. Yeah. They're going to do all of that for me, and I never have to go and do this thing that I'm really uncomfortable with. Yeah. Um, 
so that that's I was bad at it, but I was good enough to to get by. Yeah, uh, and I got better the more I did it, which I think is a great lesson. Yeah, I think a lot of people these days don't they well because powerlifting coaches are just powerlifting coaches. They do a meet, and you're a coach. Like I was the same way, but the difference is uh, like I did those hours on the gym floor, awkward hours, yep. hours with people, lots of hours with people that weren't powerlifters. Yeah, and I learned how to relate to people. Yes. And that was really uncomfortable for me. Yeah. I've gotten really a lot better at it. I don't know if I'm great at it. I think you're great at it. But thank you. But I'm a lot better than I was when I started. Yeah. That was really uncomfortable making small talk and talking to people that are outside the realm of powerlifting and stuff. And I think a lot more coaches need to do that. 100%. It used to be the the norm. That's what you did. Yeah. You built yourself from the ground up and you got that practice. A lot yeah, of people don't do sure. it now. Uh, uh, to be honest, Rob, I think that's what sets you apart from a lot of coaches is that you you do care and you do have those personal skills. Um, we're, we're strength coaches, but I, I don't care what anyone says. We're in the people business first. Yeah, yeah 100%. Uh, you know, whatever industry <laughs> we're in, we're in the people <coughs> industry before anything yeah. else. Uh, and you know, people don't care how much you know or... Or, or, or how strong you are or, or how many years' experience you have mm. if you're not a good person. Yeah. Uh, or if they do, uh, it, it generally doesn't last very long because you, you kind of get found out. So I think that you being having that experience and, and being a people person first mm. really does serve you very, very well and it's something that I definitely look up to and admire from you. Yeah. She's just going to sit there and compliment me the whole time. <laughs> I'm going to look even more red or blush. <laughs> so the, you built up your full, full roster. At what point did you find powerlifting before you left for the States or wasn't until you left for the States? No, so I, I didn't at all. So at this time I was still – I was I was coaching um, – well, I was, I was PTing the way they taught me to PT mm-hmm. at PT school. Yeah, so uh, awesomely. Or, yeah, and so <laughs> I'll go through it because it's quite funny. And, and if anyone kind of did their certificates through AIF around that 2005, 2006 mark, no, no doubt they would have been taught the same thing because yeah. this was, this was the, the way they designed a session was not necessarily uh, good from a strength and conditioning standpoint or a results standpoint. It was yeah. more just uh, make people feel good. Yeah. Um, so it was a 45-minute session. Uh, and they, were, they said we do a, a push movement, a pull movement, a legs movement, and then a stretch, and then a five-minute neck and shoulder massage while you book in their next session. Yeah. And so that was the that's how we got taught at the time to, yeah. to structure a PT session. Yeah. Um, so that's what I did for um, a, a good chunk of that first two, two and a half years. Yeah. That's just what I did, um, and it, and it worked pretty well. But that's not how I was training mm, on yep. the side. So yep. I was still training athletically, um, even though um, because I was still playing football as well. But um, I was still kind of training for that, you know, a little bit more explosive movements, some some plyometric mm-hmm. stuff, some isometrics, and some yep. Olympic lifts, a little bit of bodybuilding thrown in there, um, but no powerlifting. Uh, that wasn't something that I even knew existed at that time. Yeah. So uh, I'd say that some of your clients that might listen to this might be a little bit disappointed that they don't get the neck and shoulder massage. Yeah, yeah. I'd say so. Look, you uh, might need I to bring had, it back. I did have some pretty good <laughs> feedback from it <laughs> at the time. Yeah. Uh, it's it's certainly not something <laughs> that I would that I would do now, especially in today's climate. I, I would say it was it's probably a big red flag. Yeah, um, but definitely. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it's it's so interesting to look back. You know, that was that was quite a long time ago. Yeah. So yeah, we, so I, I did that. And what point? Sorry to interrupt, but at what point did you realize the disconnect between how you trained and how you were training people, and start to integrate the two? Yeah. So awesome question. Um, I, I did this for a long time, um, mainly because it was making me money. Yeah. Right. Um, and I was training out of the Novotel gym, so the facility that I was in, it, it didn't really allow for a whole lot. There was a, a pull-up dip station combo, a lap pull-down machine, a leg press, um, and, and a couple of treadmills and dumbbells up to like 25. Yeah. That's pretty much what we had in that gym. So I, I, what I was doing was using the facility 
probably fairly well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was getting the type of people that I was that I was training at the time. It was getting them good results. You yeah, know, they were doing more than what they were doing prior. Um, but I knew that I wanted a little bit more from myself career wise. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like I was at a period where I was at this crossroads where I, my entire childhood, all I ever wanted to do was play football professionally. Yeah. If anyone ever asked me, what are you going to do? It was, I'm just, I'm going to play football professionally and it's going to be for the Broncos. Yeah. Um, and, and I said that with so much certainty that it, it, I just, I didn't have a second option. Yeah. I, I just, that's just what I was going to do. Um, to, to my parents' dismay, <laughs> they begged me to have a second option, but I just didn't want one because that, I just knew that that's what, that's, that was what I was going to do regardless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I was at this point where I was I was at the age where I felt like I should be playing in the professional competition, um, and I wasn't. And I, I was getting plagued with injuries, mm-hmm. which has been an ongoing thing. Um, but I, I had a bad injury. I, I had a bad neck injury. Uh, I kept playing through that, and then I got a, a, a tore an ACL, mm-hmm. um, and I got a knee reconstruction. And at that point, I decided I, I need to just make a go of this training thing because the football thing's not going to work. Yep. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I I needed to get away from football as well because I loved it so much that I, I literally couldn't even bear being around it mm-hmm. at the time. Um, and around that time, I also had the opportunity to go over to America uh, and, and work with a rugby team over there mm-hmm. that was run by a South African guy. Mm-hmm. And he said, <coughs> you can come over... You can do our you can do our strength and conditioning work. You, you will give you like this temporary visa while you're here. It'll be fantastic. And yeah. I was like, cool. Serves two purposes. It, it moves me more into the direction of training athletes, mm-hmm. which is what I was passionate about at the time because I was one. Mm-hmm. I was failing as one, and I wanted to help other people not fail. Yeah. And it got me away from watching my mates progress towards the career that I wanted but felt like I, I had missed the boat on. Yeah. So it kind of served these these two purposes at the mm. time. Moved over there. I, I did that S and C for the for the rugby team for half of that season. And then the second half of the season I decided I would be the S and C coach and also play. Right. <laughs> because my athletic aspirations hadn't completely died. <laughs> yeah. Um, during that season, <laughs> I tore my other ACL right. uh, and decided that that was going to be it for, for my career mm-hmm. uh, as a football player. Um, and so I, I finished out the season with that. Uh, I needed, again, to, to get away from football altogether. Um, I joined a gym in Napa, California, wine country, beautiful place called Basics Gym. And I started training there because I, I wanted to continue training. Mm-hmm. And that's when I met my old training partner, Zach, who I think you follow on Instagram. I do, yep. Um, I know Zach. And, and Zach was a powerlifter and I went in and, and at the time I was squatting. Uh, and I, I went in and I started squatting and I was like, oh, this guy's on the other rack and he doesn't know how much I can squat, but I'm going to definitely show him. Yeah. Uh, and we started, you know, adding plates, adding plates, adding plates, and he just kept adding plates. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, I need to train with this guy. So yeah. that's when I introduced myself and I, I started training with him and he told me about powerlifting mm-hmm. and then that's where that's where powerlifting was born. So yeah. that was about, that would have been about 2000, early 2008, late 2007. Yeah. So in that time, when you went to just take a 2000, little... 2008, 2009. Yeah, little step back to when you were doing the SNC for the rugby... And you were seeing your injuries. Were you putting together the like making that dotted connection to why you were getting those injuries and starting to implement things to mitigate it in the teams? Yeah. So look, my injuries, luckily enough, were, were never like soft tissue injuries or, mm-hmm. or like as a result of not being physically prepared. I guess it was more just like impact injuries and, yeah. and as a result of the chaotic <laughs> nature of sport. Yeah. Um, so things you can't avoid things, things I just couldn't avoid, um, you know, like getting dumped on my head and, yeah. and breaking vertebrae in my neck and, yeah. and getting okay. bent back over with Tong and guys landing on me and, and breaking ACLs. Yeah. So things that, I could be the strongest man on the planet. Those things are, are probably still going to happen. Yeah. But 
from a, a session design perspective or like a, a an overview of, of periodization, I, I definitely have kept principles that I learnt very early on in those years and, and carried them through to now while still adding bits and pieces. Yeah, so yeah I started to form those those thoughts fairly early. Yeah. And so when you're in the States and then take a jump back to when we get into the States, you weren't coaching as much once the rugby finished? Yeah, so I was still coaching. Um, I started PTing a little bit out of basics gym. Yep. Um, I, was, I was coaching some friends and family. It was all cash work there because I was, I was there you know, not on a work visa. Yep. Um, so I wasn't able to actually get a job, mm -hmm. um, which coaching was great for. Uh, because we could just do cash. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was coaching, and I have been coaching the entire time. Yeah. Which has been nice. You know, ever since I first started uh, till now, I've, I've always coached in some capacity. Mm -hmm. um, I was working, I ended up being able to, to get a work visa, started working doors, um, as a, a lot of PTs do or, yeah. or bodybuilders do at the time, um, powerlifters. Know, we're, we're bigger than most people, so that puts us in good stead to mm -hmm. kick people out of clubs. Um, so I started doing that at night. Um, I was coaching people a little bit during the day and and just started powerlifting. Yep. Um, we were doing you, you did your first meet over there? Yeah, so yeah. I trained I trained with Zach. We trained Westside um, and we, we followed Westside religiously for a, a good amount of time, I'd mm -hmm. say 12, 18 months before he said you should – you should do a meet. Mm -hmm. um, we, we would train primarily out of Basics Gym. Um, there was a, a local powerlifter out of, I think he was in San Jose, which is just, just like right next door to Napa. Um, his name was Scott Cartwright. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was, he was very big in, in the Northern California powerlifting scene and at the time. He was a, a columnist for Elite FTS, I believe, yep. a, a sponsored athlete from a bunch of those guys. I think he was sponsored by Spud Inc., um, and, and a few of those powerlifting companies that were are big now, but were you know really quite big then, especially. Yeah. Um, and he had a little team, so we did a little a few sessions with him out of his gym. He'd take us over to to Super Training Gym in Sacramento and do mm -hmm. some sessions out of there every now and then. And I really started to to fall in love with the the strength sports and of powerlifting specifically because. Mm -hmm. As someone with no ACL, you know, I couldn't really run and jump and change direction very well, but I could squat. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I could I could I could do this thing where I felt like it still scratched my competitive itch, mm -hmm. I guess. Um and, and I liked it. I, I liked that it was hard mm -hmm. and I liked that you weren't ever just handed anything. Yeah. You, you can't just walk in and say, I want to squat more today. You have to do the work, otherwise it's not gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Um, so we did that, and then in 2011, I did my first powerlifting meet. It was called the North Bay Raw Challenge, I believe, out of Concord, California. Uh, a gym there called uh, something Barbell. I can't remember the name of the gym. Do starts with D. Something Barbell in, uh, in Concord, California. I was in the 308 weight class, which... 140s. 140s. Yep. Uh, and I was, was definitely not a, a good 140 at the time. <laughs> I, I, was, I, was, I was a sloppy 140. Yep. Um, 25 years old. And I did, I think I, I squatted somewhere around the 140, 145... I benched 125, which I was stoked with at the time, and my deadlift was 210, mm -hmm. uh, and I was I was over the moon with yeah. that. <laughs> awesome. And looking back, it's pretty funny, but yeah, yeah. at the time I was I was stoked. I, I won my weight class. I came first. I got a medal. Yeah, I was the only one in it. Yeah, <laughs> you still won. It's powerlifting. <laughs> it is. Can't control who shows yeah, up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was 2011. Um, then you didn't do your next meet for a long time. I didn't do my next meet for a long time. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that. After that meet, I, at that meet, I met a bunch of uh, equipped lifters. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were kind enough to just give me their stuff. Like, yep. and, and I think this just really 
this really just encapsulates powerlifting and the powerlifting community so well mm -hmm. is I was just this 25 year old kid. No one knew who I was. I was just, I was an Aussie in East Bay, California at, at this gym full of powerlifters that were, that were strong, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Dan Bell competed out of there. Yeah. Um, I did a podcast recently with with Jordan Shallow, the, the muscle doc, who has yep. done quite well in powerlifting. He competed out of there. Yeah, right. you know, all around this same time, you know, these guys that are you know, powerlifting royalty, really, they, mm. they're they're competing out of these gyms, and and I'm just this 25 year old Aussie kid, and started talking to this guy, and he's like, oh, I do equipped lifting. He's like, I've got no idea what that is. Yeah, can you tell me? And he's like, sure. Look at these videos um, that I have. Uh, this is a quick powerlifting and he pulled out a bunch of bench shirts that he had in his in his bag and he was like this is what a bench press shirt is like you, you put this on and you sit like this and then you bench press and it's really cool i was like wow this this sounds really cool is this hard to do and he was like yeah it's a lot <laughs> harder than doing it without the stuff on yeah i was like cool i might i might do this where do i buy this stuff from and he was like here's a deadlift suit that you can squat and deadlift in it was a, a metal yep um a metal suit and he said you can squat and deadlift in this one mm -hmm. um and, and here's a bench shirt um you can have those they'll yeah. probably fit you i was like cool <laughs> cool literally i've been talking to this guy for 10 minutes and yeah. he's just giving me his stuff and i thought this is great i'm this is what i'm gonna do uh went back to my mate my mate's backyard shed in uh, St. Helena, California, mm -hmm. where he had a power rack set up. And I said, I'm going to learn how to use this squat suit. He wasn't there at the time. He was at, his, at work. And I loaded up the bar and I put the squat suit on. And I tried to squat like I normally would. And the bar went that way. And I <laughs> went that way. <laughs> and I went straight through his barn wall. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my... My first introduction to equipped powerlifting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I got into that a little bit. I trained equipped for a little while. Um, I moved out of equipped. I did um, five three one for mm. for a little while for a, a long time. I did um, juggernaut for for a little while when that came yeah. out as well, and and I liked that because there was a bit of jumping in there and, and stuff as well. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, didn't do my next meet. For a very long time, a very long time when I came back to Australia, actually, yeah. literally like years, in, decades later. Yeah. Um, but still, that whole time, we're training, keeping up the power lifts. Yeah. So, majority of that time in between 2011 when I competed and when was my next one? 2000 and. What year are we now? 2024. 2024. Would have been 2022. Yeah. Um, majority of that gap was strength training. It would have been either, you know, big bouts of 531, um, which I think is a fantastic program. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I did all of the variations of that. I did the, the original 531, the 531 for football, the 531 yep. for skinny bastards. I, I've Literally any five three one variation, I've done it, yeah. um, and, and I liked it. So I and then I had periods of going back to West Side, doing some West Side. Um, I did West Side for Skinny Bastards, the the Joe DeFranco mm -hmm. version of that. I did literally any the con I did the um, the Juggernaut for a while, like I said, but m mostly strength based, yeah. um, just because of the 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 knee like I don't have an ACL yep. um, and I didn't have an ACL and and I'd never really <coughs> tested my ability to move laterally or, or run or jump or do anything like that I just was like I'm gonna get as strong as I possibly can mm -hmm. and I know that I can do that it doesn't hurt my knees so that's what I'm gonna do yeah um, so the majority of that time was just focused on getting strong yeah I like that um your introduction to equipped powerlifting is pretty much everybody's introduction to equipped powerlifting it's like Here's it. Have you heard of equipped powerlifting? And we're like the Mormons of, <laughs> yeah. of the strength world. It's like, have you heard about our Lord and Saviour? Yes. Multiply. Um, <laughs> yeah. Here, have some. Like, yeah. I, do, I can't count the amount of stuff I've given away. Like, Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> exactly what it was. And the, the, the kindness that that man showed me, mm -hmm. and like I felt like, wow, this guy wants me to do what he's doing and he doesn't even know me and then he's going to give me this 
stuff. Yeah. Like, this is, I don't know what this is, but I like it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that was definitely something that, and I've never competed uh, multiply or, 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 or equipped, but it might happen. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. If you fit into my single ply bench shirt, you might, that might change. Yeah, it's something that I'm considering. <laughs> but yeah, during that time, I was I was still coaching, um, mm-hmm. and a lot of my coaching, um, I, I still I would still coach a lot of athletes, but I would coach a lot of uh, general population people as well, um, which I, I think is important to do both and and just keep your finger on the pulse of of what's happening yep. um, and 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 stay in the game. Um, but a lot of my coaching as well was geared towards principles that I'd picked up throughout my years of of strength training as well um and things that I'd taken from 531 and from juggernaut and from west side and and how do I put this into what I know from the early years of of coaching athletes in field sports and and other things and how do we kind of blend all of these things into I guess um a a method or or a system that that I like Mm -hmm. that is and, and and not getting married to one thing, but but having to a toolbox full of things that you can implement when you see necessary. I think yeah. was was something that I was really forming through those years. Yeah. So when you came back to Australia and like you were working at World Gym and then you were with us at Under Strength, mm-hmm. what did your kind of methodology look like in that period of time? Because it has recently changed, and we'll get to that. Mm-hmm. What's well, recently? progressed or transitioned i should say yeah but what did it look like in that period of time because it was a lot different to what it is now yeah 100 percent. so when i stepped back into into i guess the competitive world of powerlifting which um whether i should have or shouldn't have is a whole nother topic but (laughs) i did um and i I felt like i wasn't done yet um and so i did that and and i went out and, and i hired a coach and that coach became a mentor um, and you know, shout out to, to Will, Will Crozier, and he's fantastic and he's been fantastic since the, the very first day that I reached out to him. Yep. Um, but I, I went through a mentorship with him. I, I was coached by him um, through the, the first, those, those competitive meets that I did. Um, and that really started to form uh, a... a a way that I thought about strength training, uh, it, it really added to, to that. Um, so it, it moved a little bit more away from the, the West Side style, the, the conjugate style of, of training, which mm-hmm. I did for a very long time, and moved more towards that, that block, the, the linear style of, mm-hmm. of strength training. Um, and I followed that and I saw great results on that and... Um, I did start to to implement a lot of that for the, the athletes that I was coaching at the time as well, yep. um, and still do to this day for for certain athletes as well. I think there's there's merit in doing that. Yeah, hundred um, percent. For for some people, for sure. Yeah, that's like I had some conversations. So we just recently had GPC Nationals, which we were both at this weekend in Newcastle. That went really well, but I had multiple conversations that weekend, and some of them revolved around conjugate because people come to me. To talk about conjugate, of course, knowing that I'm the the salesman of conjugate around the yeah, yeah conjugate's kind of like the CrossFit of the powerlifting world. Yeah, it's like if you do conjugate, you yeah. can't actually do it unless you tell everyone. Yeah, that's you it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows you're a vegan unless you tell them you're a vegan. It's the same with conjugate. You have got to talk about it all the time. Yeah, um, but again, it's like equip lifting. We're like we're gonna we're, it's our lord and savior. Where everyone needs to know yeah. about the benefits of conjugate. <laughs> Um, so I was talking about about that, and I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that you only follow like this very strict kind of conjugate system, and it's like, well, no, it's a blueprint to operate within. Block and linear are the same. Obviously, linear is a bit more rigid in that it has to linearly progress. Block and conjugate are really similar in that you pick what you want to work on and you're working on that. Yep, it's just a different time frame. Yeah, and it's different. You might with block, you might just work on a aspect of something for a block whatever that block timeline looks like yeah whereas conjugate you're probably going to work on a bit more at the same time yeah that's really the only difference yeah but yeah the, i think the misconception is that you have to be married to this one idea it's like oh no the beauty of like if i'm operating under a conjugate system 
and I can already see the messages popping up on my phone saying, you're talking about conjugate again. Um, <laughs> I'm here for it. Let's yeah, do it. Some of my clients are like, oh, we ne- you nearly got through a whole episode without <laughs> saying conjugate. <laughs> this one's not it, guys. Um, is that I'm not married to a, a system. So I can, like you said, you take the tool, I've got all these tools, and I go, what one does this person need right now to progress on what they need to progress? Yeah, and I think that's where we share a very similar outlook on coaching. Yeah, 100%. Mm. And, and so, like, where I'm at now is, you touched on it a little bit, is, is like I have kind of pr- progressed <coughs> a little bit in the way that I think about um, programming and, and periodization at the moment and and we do want to have or i feel like we should have these overarching principles Mm -hmm. um that we follow and and those principles are going to be governed by what your personal beliefs as a coach are and and there's there's multiple different ways to skin a cat and, and i love that um but i also don't think that there needs to be rules mm-hmm. um i think that we we have these principles that we can follow mm-hmm. Um, but we also can identify the physical qualities that we're trying to um, progress in or we're, we're trying to elicit a response from, whether yep. that be strength, whether mm-hmm. that be speed, whether it be power, whether it be endurance, whether it be flexibility, whatever it is. Yep. Um, we have all of these attributes that we – I call them buckets or, or columns that we want to touch. Um, and we can – we can make a system that is able to touch all of those things when we require them, uh, and that might be that might mean maybe our if we're a powerlifter, maybe our main lift might follow more of a, a block or a linear um, trajectory um, mm-hmm. through a period of time, um, but maybe our accessories might follow more of a, a conjugate. Mm-hmm. style of, of training where they rotate based on what the requirements are or what the physical attributes are that we're trying to to bring up. Yeah. Um, and I don't think that it needs to be one or the other. It, it can be both. Yeah. Um, like, why not both? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. It's a flat bottom taco. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at at the moment is, is you know, I, I might program you competition squat and this week it might be, 100 kilos and next week it might be 105 kilos and then it might be 110 and then it might be 115 and then it might be 120 and that's very much a traditional block way of doing things but your accessories might be different this week and next week and the week after and the week after that yeah um or it might not be that style it's there's really no rules yeah i think with the the explosion of powerlifting in the last 14 years really since 2010 ish with it becoming so big the methods of training that became big with it kind of le- led people to believe that that's the only way to do things yeah it's like, well no there's all this stuff beforehand where they work too so i yeah. think people are starting to come around to the fact that you know it doesn't just have to be western periodization it, 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 it heaps it other methods yeah and and the thing that i always say as well is i feel like um, strength and conditioning or, or strength coaching mm-hmm. um, or a physical culture, I guess, is, is what I would term the, the, the quote-unquote you know, fitness industry encompassing everything from the, the person that very first starts up to the, the competitive athlete. And if yep. we look at physical culture as a whole, it's, it's young. It's very young. So what's to say that the best way we don't actually know yet? Yeah. Um, and if that's the case, how are we going to know unless we try things yeah. and, and we start to push the boundaries and we, we take what we know here and then maybe we expand upon that or maybe mm-hmm. we take well, this works and this works and this also works. But what if we take the things we like from all of them and what if we put them together yeah. and create this whole new thing? Yeah. And who's to say that that's not going to be better? Yeah. Like that's how things move forward and it that's is. how that's how progression through industries happen. And I feel like we're in a space now with you know, the, the time that we're in and the, the abundance of information that's out there, it, it's moving forward at a pace that I like. Yep. Um and, and I just kinda wanna be I wanna be there helping to, to push it in that direction. Yeah. 
I had this conversation particularly with Jake Dolishaw when he was on and said, are you seeing stuff? Because he's very evidence-based and he looks at the science particularly within nutrition and health but also in training. Yep. I'm saying, are you, I said to him, are you seeing stuff that was happening 50 years ago that now science is proving to be the best way forward? Yep. And long answer short is that yes, he, there is. They, they were so close to understanding the biology of it or the biomechanics of something. Yep. Just not quite there but just through trial and error they almost got there and now 50 years later we're going, oh, yeah, that's actually – this is what's happening here. Yeah. And it's a really optimal way to do things. Yeah. And the the science isn't settled. It's always progressing. So yep. what, what says that it's not if we try something now? If we innovate now, then in 50 years people are going to look back and go, yo, they figured it out then. That was, they were onto it. Yeah. And no one knows. 100%. <laughs> about and, it. And, and don't get me wrong. Like I, I'm not – I don't want to be – it's just some wild cowboy that just, you know, yeah, slings from the hip and just does random things just f for the sake of randomness because yeah. I, I, I certainly don't subscribe to that theory. Um, I, I do I do like to consider myself um, a, a practitioner of sports science. Yeah. It's something that I'm studying at the moment and, and extremely passionate about. And a, a big part of that is understanding the science behind things and the research behind things. But a big part of that as well is, is understanding the context of what that research is and, and, mm -hmm. and then how we can apply that. It can be done in so many different ways. Yeah. Um, and just because one person did it this way doesn't mean that that's the only way. Yep. Um, and, and also it doesn't mean that that's the only way we have to do things for the rest of eternity. Oh, yeah. We can look to to take these principles that we know and it will, if we use, um, you know, our, our cognitive ability and, and look and say, if, if this works and this works and this works, and these might be the principles as to why they're working. Mm -hmm. What if we apply those principles in this situation and to this athlete in, in under this scenario and let's just see if it works. Yeah. And then if it does, let's do that a hundred more times. And then if it works more than 50% of the time, then fantastic. That's probably a, a good hypothesis that yeah. something might be a, a good thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and we can kind of use that anecdotal evidence then and, and tie that back into some evidence-based practice mm. as well. I think there's validity in both. Oh, definitely. I think that also the, the the cowboy stuff needs to exist and also needs to have its, like, zealot gurus. Like, you know, David Weck is crazy. <laughs> Straight <laughs> crazy. Like, you listen to him speak for 30 seconds, you know <laughs> that dude is crazy. But some of the stuff he's talking about has is very, very interesting and stuff I've tried and done, I've done workshops with Weck Method stuff before and integrated some of the stuff into my training that's been hugely beneficial. Yeah. And it's like, well, I can take from that and I can take from this and like people like Joel Seedman, people hate that guy with a passion yeah. and people love him too. Yeah, I'm sure people would love the money that he's making though. Yeah, <laughs> but there's got to be some vali validity to some of the stuff that he does. Maybe not all of it and it's not the way, but some of it is useful. It's the same, like Louis was the same. He was a zealot for the way he trained. Yeah. This is the way. Yeah. He also understood that there was more than one way, but he was the, the person who's like, this is how you should do it and this is why you should do it. And he was very much black and white in yep. that. But he ne they need to exist like that so we can all step back as the people disseminating the information and go, okay, well, that doesn't work for this person. Yeah, 100%. And, you know, those those guys paved the way for for the next generation to, to come through and, yeah. and expand upon that stuff as well. You know, yeah, so all the, the crazy people that are doing crazy shit now. They're, they're crazy enough to put themselves out there, Yeah, right? And and I think that's the main thing is because if no one ever does that, the industry never moves forward. Mm. And, like, even the ATG guys get heaps of flack. Mm -hmm. And rightfully so because they're cringe, like, to be <laughs> perfectly <laughs> honest. But do I use some of their techniques? Yes, because they're useful. Yeah. Like having your knee travel over your toe through a greater range of motion is very good for healthy knees. Yeah. Uh, is yeah. it like the be all and end all? Probably not. Is it useful in certain circumstances? Yes. So. Yeah. And uh, yeah, yeah, exactly right. And I think if we want to tie this, 
you know, back into to, to powerlifting and into my journey and where we're at now, it, mm. it's super similar because, you know, take the take the ATG guys for example, and I don't I don't know a whole lot about um, David Wack and Joel Seidman, but I, I do know a little bit about the ATG guys, and the the thing that I like about it is that knees forward is great. Yeah, is it the only thing that you need to do, and is it like the elixir of life? No, probably not. No. <laughs> you know, like, is the, the tib anterior like the most important muscle in your entire body? Probably not. Like, no. do I need to do tib raises um, or f- to stop my lower leg exploding? Probably not. Mm-hmm. But can that stuff be beneficial in the it, 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 within a completely well-rounded program? Yep. For sure. Mm-hmm. And without it, is it a bad program? No. But when you have someone that is so so solely focused on on one thing um that kind of becomes their thing right Mm -hmm. and so and that's what happened to me with with powerlifting and strength it was like okay i'm doing powerlifting now i only care about getting strong yeah uh and you know that's that's one physical quality, um, but that's the only physical quality that really matters when that's what you get judged on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, w- we can say, oh, a- ATG is is crazy or David Wex crazy because all he talks about is rotation. Yeah. Um, but, you know, all I spoke about for a long time was how to get stronger. Yeah. And, and that's essentially the same thing, just a, a different quality. Yeah. Um, it's just more people who agree with you than them sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So what? Well, so firstly, what kind of precipitated your transition away from just being strong, and what does your training look like now? Yeah, um, fantastic question. Um, touchy subject, but that's okay. Um, so GPC Nationals last year, not not the one just passed, so twenty twenty three. I was lucky enough to get invited and compete at that nationals that's where i put up my my best total Mm -hmm. 767 and a half uh and through that prep especially uh my knee my left knee which is the knee that i have no acl in was just starting to give me a a lot of trouble it was constantly swollen Mm -hmm. like really 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 swollen Uh, i couldn't walk pretty much at all um you would see me hobbling around Mm -hmm. all of the time uh and i would just take a a ton of voltaren just to get through training sessions but outside of training sessions just life was absolute agony Mm -hmm. um post i got through nationals uh, put up a, a total that to, to be quite honest with you, I'm, I'm really proud of. Um, it's not the biggest total in the world, but yep. for for me coming from uh, <laughs> the, the total that I put up in 2011 to, to that one, I'm, I'm really happy with. Um, post that, I was on crutches. I literally could not put any weight on my leg. It was, My knee was a balloon. It, it was excruciating pain like when i say excruciating pain it was like a nine nine and a half out of ten mm-hmm. every waking moment of the day yeah uh, and i i just thought this is uh, what am i doing this is this is horrible i need to get this seen to so i went and saw um one of your one of your gracious sponsors hunter performance physio i saw tim over there yep i um, mean he sent me for scans and found out not only do I have no ACL in the in that left knee, but I also have tricompartmental degenerative disease and severe osteoarthritis in, in that knee and, and the other knee also. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that left knee specifically was, was very, very, very bad. Mm-hmm. Um, so he sent me to um, an ortho and with my scans and I, I went up there and I saw him and he said, generally... Uh, I would never do this for someone your age, uh, but you need a full knee replacement. Yeah. Not a reconstruction. I, like, I need to cut your knee out and put a new one in there because that's that knee is got completely gone. Yeah. That was really tough 
for me to hear mm -hmm. at, at 38. Um, and I know a joke about being old all of the time, but in, in the grand scheme of things, 38 is really not that old. No. Um, and to be told that you are literally broken to the point where like, we need to cut you open and, and put fake joints in you, um, I took that really hard. As someone that has prided themselves on their physical fitness my entire life and mm. I started the podcast by saying I identified as an athlete from literally as far back as I could remember. Yeah. To, to be told that not only are you not an athlete but if we don't do this you probably can't walk was a huge kick in the teeth. Like, I, And I'm getting emotional talking about it because that was – I remember sitting there and that, that sucked um, – so I decided in that moment that I was going to prove them wrong. Yep. Yeah. And so, and I, so like, for those who don't know, I was there through all of this. This is when you were working at Hunter Strength, so I've seen it all firsthand and I know how hard it was for you because I watched it. And you, not only in through, through conversations we had, but in your body language, that changed. You know, that's, that's, it is a hard one. Yeah, it, it was horrible, mate, honestly. Um, it, it was something that really rocked me to my core. Yep. Um, and I decided in that moment that not only was I going to prove them wrong, uh, I was going to I, I, I was gonna do it myself and I was going to – when I did it, I was going to show other people that it can be done as well and I can show other people that there's a better way. Yep. Um, and I think that that's – that's really stuck with me and, and, you know, like, yeah, that moment sitting there and, and hearing that is something that I never want anyone else to, to feel again. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that was really a catalyst for looking at how is this, how have I let this get to this point? Mm -hmm. um, what are the what are the contributing factors that I have control over that have that have got me here that I can? What's the low hanging fruit? How can I make some immediate change here? Um, and the first thing was I, I needed to drop weight, uh, and th that came with its own set of benefits. But the the main benefit of that was I need to to drop weight so that it, walking isn't so hard on my knee. Yeah. Um, I need to unload that joint a little bit. Um, so that's what I did. Um, luckily enough, my wife is a fantastic sports nutritionist who's who's studying um, to be a, a sports dietitian at the moment. And it, it, I, honest to God, she is a wizard, um, and she's been able to handle my nutrition from that day and get me to the point now where I'm literally like 30, 36 ish kilos down. Yep. Um, and my performance through that time hasn't suffered. Um, I've still trained the whole time. I haven't lacked energy, etc. Um, but that was the first step. I need to I need to lose weight. Um, the second part of that was I need to I need to move in a few different directions instead of just up and down. Yeah. <laughs> um, I need to get out of that sagittal plane. And you know, as powerlifters, that's that's what we do, right? Yeah. It's like sagittal, sagittal sagittal and then we're going to do a little bit more sagittal yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to top it off yeah um so i needed to to throw in a few more things there and it was a it was it, it, st it started out as like this this really horrible moment of you can't do this thing that you've grown to love and that you've really tied your identity to for the last however many years yeah you know, since you couldn't play football anymore, you, you're now this this strong guy. You can't do this anymore. So who are you? And that was something that I had multiple conversations with you about and, and multiple conversations with my wife about in in the confines of our home of like, well, if I'm not the if I'm not Big Nick, like who am I? And, and if I don't squat three hundred kilos, like what do I do? You know, what do I put on Instagram? What do I talk about? Who who am I as a person? Um, and so I, I went through this transition where I, I really had to 
as, as lame as it sounds, like I really had to find myself again. And I had to figure out like, who, who are you outside of powerlifting? Yeah. Um, and it was, it's been a, it's been a nice journey. Yeah. Um, it's, it's been a nice journey to go through. I think a lot of people talk shit on, and I think I've talked about this with BJ when he was on, is it like, you know, powerlifting changed my life or these, these things and how it did that for me. So I can't, say it's cringe when other people do it but your identity can't be a thing that can be taken away Mm. like that you know identity have to come has to come from within from something that can exist whether you can do the thing or not yes if you were stuck in a wheelchair not able to do anything unable to speak are you still like what's your identity then yeah you have to that identity has to come from within so i think that it's a good lesson to learn unfortunately hard one yeah. For people. But yeah, I think a lot of people get wrapped up in that. This is my identity. I'm a coach. I'm a powerlifter. I'm a this, I'm a that. Yes. It's like we can't have these, they're, they're things that are ephemeral by nature. We're not gonna, I'm not going to be a powerlifter forever. 100%. It's not possible. Mm-hmm. So no, uh, I agree with you. You have it, to. Yeah, that's that's the, the realization that mm. I've been able to come to now is, is throughout. And, and it's not just powerlifting that my identity was wrapped in. It yeah. was, you're an athlete. Yeah. Whether it be you're a strength athlete mm-hmm. or whether it be you're a field athlete or, or whether it be prior to that, you're a, you're a swimmer. Yeah. You know, that's what I did in my early years. But from, from my whole life, I was, you're an athlete. Mm-hmm. And then if you're not an athlete, who are you? Uh, and it, it's really nice to be at the point now where... I've realized that I'm I am who I am. I'm I'm Nick mm-hmm. and I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I'm a good person. And I'm not a, a coach isn't who I am. An athlete isn't who I am. Uh, being strong isn't who I am. It's what I do. Uh, and I think that's a very big uh, distinction to make and it's been a very powerful distinction to yeah. make for me is I love coaching I love helping people I love everything about it but yeah. it's not who I am it's what I do mm-hmm. and and if that goes away I'm still me yeah yeah and like kind of ironically the things that make you who you are are how you do the thing it's not the thing it's how you do it so yes. if you do it with integrity you do it with passion that's your identity yes you're a passionate person with heaps of integrity who does whatever they do well whether it be coaching being a a husband or a dad or any of that stuff like it's how you do the thing not what you do so as painful as it is to learn some of those lessons it's the painful lessons that are are good good ones in the end aren't they yeah i guess that's what life's about yeah yeah Yeah, well you said earlier that you you liked doing these things because they're hard things yeah growing up Unfortunately, it's pretty hard too. It is. Yeah, it <laughs> is. You get thrown some of those curly ones and you're like, fuck, yeah. did I really have to go through that? Until like five years down the track you go, yeah, I did because that made me hear who I am. Yeah, That absolutely. built my character. Absolutely. So what does your training look like now? Now that you've you've gotten out of this sagittal plane, these static movements, you're starting to move around and twist and turn. Starting to move a little bit, yeah. Yeah, and well, like awesome to watch because you do heaps of shit that I'm like, far out, I couldn't do that. <laughs> Um, but I also like want to do that. Like, there's heaps of stuff that you post. I'm like, oh, I want to do that. So it's like, kind of fun, man. Yeah, yeah. Like one in particular, I think was the um, Anderson split squats with yeah. bands. I was yeah. like, oh, that's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but now you're moving into these athletic movements. You're working with teams again. You're working with athletes again outside more, like branching away from powerlifters. Yeah, still got your powerlifters, but you're adding in athletes so what does what does training look like now under nz athletics yeah so um my, so you're right so training now is is it's this beautiful collection of of everything that i've learned over the over the years mm-hmm. uh, all kind of merged in into this toolbox of of things that i i can implement at, at any point for for any athlete that I'm working with and myself included. So through this journey of of moving myself away from just doing squatting and benching and deadlifting and and the the variations of 
has been a, a journey of exploration into moving back into some more plyometric training, some rotational training, some running, uh, some bilateral movements, some unilateral movements, you know, all, all sorts of things, some banded stuff, some, some chains, some accommodating resistance, some mm -hmm. all sorts of like things where I'm just, I'm playing with the idea of how do we categorize or how do I categorize movements? Um, how, do, how do, what's, what does my movement library look like? Yeah. You know, does it have to just be push, pull legs or mm -hmm. can we break things down into, um, you know, vertical, horizontal, knee, hip dominant, you know, overhead, can we even go as far as to break things down into eccentric, concentric dominant, which is something that I'm playing with a lot lately and yeah. you and I have spoken about that a lot. And can we can we really lean into these qualities of a movement mm -hmm. and load them appropriately so that we're getting the full benefit of, say, the eccentric or the strength dominant portion of a movement and not then underloading that because the concentric is to follow. Yeah. Um, and so how can we separate the two to really train the qualities that both are fantastic for? Um, so playing with that a little bit, but then also still incorporating the, 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 the rules of SNC, I guess, that you would follow along the lines of programming principles with some conjugate stuff in there and, and some all different types of athletes that we're working with I yeah. still have a nice base of powerlifters that are that are benefiting from having some other movements in their programming mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't want my athletes to go down the same route that I went and and have the same injuries that I had so mm -hmm. you know a lot of my powerlifters or all of my powerlifters get resiliency work added into their programming yep. which which might be at the start or it might be at the end and it's it's just putting them in some different planes of movement that that aren't really typical for, for powerlifting um as almost like a prehab um within their program yep. to to stop some of those overuse things um well, some of those overuse things can really be like somewhat mitigated or you know recovered through not much work mm -hmm. like if you're just doing a baseline level of a little bit here and there yeah you're gonna like doing stuff for tendon health is gonna hopefully stave off tendonitis a bit yeah 100%. sometimes you can't sometimes you just got to roll with it and deal yeah, with it yeah there's there's certainly things like i believe there's certainly things that you can do to really mitigate the the chances of of being in horrible amounts of pain mm. um now I'm a, I'm a firm believer that you know, as a power lifter your your off season really really should look like a general strength and conditioning program mm -hmm. for the most part anyway until you get to the 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 prep or side of things and then you can really get more into the specific spe specificity mm -hmm. um but as long as you're ticking some some big boxes you can work on other qualities and i think yeah. that you should uh, i really think that if we think about um it as a pyramid um, we want a really good base of general physical qualities to build our peak from mm -hmm. um, if that peak if that base is short the peak is going to be to be smaller yeah. if we have a big broad base of general physical qualities and movement options that we can build from we can build a really tall pyramid from that mm -hmm. um, and, and that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to do competition standard SBD three times a week, 12 months a year. Yeah. In fact, I think you shouldn't do that. Um, so uh, a, a lot of my athletes or all of my athletes will go through general physical preparation stages of, of working on other physical qualities, whether it be power, whether it be speed or endurance mm -hmm. uh, and str as well as strength. Um, strength for powerlifters being the predominant quality that we want, but we don't, do that and neglect the other qualities. Um, you think about building, you know, I, I played FIFA when I was growing up. You think about building a soccer player on FIFA, mm -hmm. you know, you're going to put a little bit in the speed column, you're going to put a little bit in the agility column, in, the, in yeah. the shooting column. You don't just put it all in one column and then have all of the others at zero mm. because that player is going to suck. 
you know, you might be dominant in one quality, but you still have some attributes in the other columns also. Yeah. Um, and where the dominant column is will be dependent on what the requirements of the sport are. So say a powerlifter is going to be predominantly a strength athlete. Yeah. I think there's 100% validity in training power for a strength athlete. Mm -hmm. the, the studies show that. The research that I've looked at shows that. The conversations I've had with you, I know you agree. Mm -hmm. That's why you do speed days. Yep. Um, people... Other people may not agree, but I agree. I think that there's definitely validity in that. And mm -hmm. even from a fun perspective, it's fun to move things fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's also like, it's less less overall load. So a speed day is good because you're practicing a movement and whether you're getting stronger or not, let's leave that out of the conversation. You're getting better at the movement. Yes. You're getting faster at the movement. You're getting more comfortable moving it fast. Yep. You're also reducing overall load through the week so you recover better so therefore next time something heavy comes around you're not as buggered from doing heavy rep work as yep. your secondary day so yeah you're getting you get you're practicing the skill at the very least yeah aren't yeah you? grease in the groove yep 100 yeah. percent, and and that's something that i 100 percent believe in um but yeah that's that's kind of what it looks like i mean for for a power lifter the, the beauty for the power lifters that i work with now is they have the benefit of me working with a, a bunch of other athletes. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, uh, I'm lucky enough to work with a hockey, a field hockey player, uh, a, a rock climber, a couple of, of league players, union players, a swimmer, a runner. There's, there's a bunch, but some basketball players. There's a, there's a wide array of different sports and yeah. a lot of those sports are played weekly. Mm. Um, so when you're periodizing training around a, a game every single week, that becomes a lot more difficult to do than, say, periodizing training around one to two meets a year. Yeah. Um, so my powerlifters get the benefit of me growing as a coach and learning how to train all of these different qualities yeah. on a weekly basis without impacting the most important thing, which is the game every single week. Mm -hmm. Um, and then when you come back to powerlifting and, and you coach an athlete that needs to be ready essentially twice a year, showcasing one quality, that, yeah. that becomes a picture that, that almost becomes a lot easier to, to, to paint because there's, there's a lot less moving pieces. Mm. Well, there's another benefit to working with gen pop people or just having a lot of experience on the floor of a gym outside of powerlifters because you learn how to how other people need it not because like yeah it'll make you a good powerlifting coach maybe yeah but it'll make you good at getting people strong yeah but will their quality of life be good will they will they be able to run down the street without tearing a hamstring mm. like if they need to for whatever reason if they're going to chase their puppy or their toddler or you know they steal something and run, need to run from the cops yeah like you don't want to tear your hamstring in the middle of that like <laughs> <laughs> You know, you need to still live life. 100%. You're not just just doing the meat and sitting around like a vegetable the rest of the year. So Ideally. Yeah. Ideally so, you're not. Things you can learn from training athletes who need to perform at a high level every week can translate to a powerlifter who needs to live life and not, you know, run out of breath going up one flight of stairs. Yeah, I agree. And and look, the, you know, that's a conversation that you and I have, have had a little bit as well around like conditioning for powerlifters mm. and just conditioning in general and what does that look like? And I think, you know, I, I don't even really like the term conditioning for powerlifters because it implies that it has to be different for, of conditioning for, yeah. for anyone else and it, and it really doesn't. No, you know, it's just conditioning. Conditioning is just conditioning and, yeah. and powerlifters should do more of it because it's going to make them a better powerlifter yeah. at the end of the day. Um, yeah. If you don't get puffed out by doing one set and you can do three sets – that's gonna. That's a benefit, yeah. Because you're going to get stronger because you're doing more work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's and it. So, this is what I try and tell people: is like, trust me, it's not. It's not going to make you worse. It's going to make you better. Yeah. Not only is it not going to make you worse, it's actually going to make you a lot better. Yeah. Um, and healthier as well. Yeah. Well, and another uh, another thing on a really small level is like, especially during dynamic days, 
for my guys, particularly for equip guys, right? So you'll do, say you got nine sets of three on squats. I want you to do those three reps on one breath. Because mm-hmm. when you do a max effort squat, you're going to need to hold your breath for a long time. Yeah. Especially if it's like you're fighting for depth yeah. in a suit. So that is something that's seemingly small to benefit this max effort day. But holding your breath and doing work on a speed day with a short rest, that's going to raise your heart rate up. So you're getting conditioning through just the work that you're doing that's kind of inconsequential, Yeah. but it's going to bring your base level of GPP up. 100%. Hopefully. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, <laughs> I put this uh, I put this reel on, on Instagram earlier this year and it was a, you know, a really easy tip to to improve your bench press is stop breathing between reps. Yeah. And it, there was there was so many comments of, of people that are like, oh, you, you, what do you mean I should hold my breath for five reps? And I was just like, yes. yeah, that's exactly, <laughs> that's quite literally exactly what I mean yeah. is, is do not breathe in between your reps. Yeah. And, you know, one of, the, I, I, I never wrote this in the comments, but I just thought to myself, wow, like a, a set of, five or, or even a set of 10 it's it's like it's less than a minute mm. of work and if you can't hold your breath for a minute you probably should work on that <laughs> <laughs> and and you will see some benefit from it yeah you know and that's a, that's a full set you know like less than that a set of three a set of five it's mm. it doesn't take very long to do no you, you really should be able to hold your breath for that if and embrace effectively. Yeah. And, and if it's hard, it's hard. It's good that it's hard because you'll get better. It's something you can improve. That's low hanging fruit, like you're talking about. Yep. If you can improve improve your lung capacity through repetition, that's going to be better for more oxygen in your brain. For one, more oxygen in your body. Hundred percent. And you're going to get better at breathing. Hundred percent. Just from holding your breath on a bench press. And it can keep <laughs> your blood pressure. Uh, yeah, in, in a in a nice range as well. Yeah, you know what's what's one thing that we see all of the time in powerlifting is notoriously high blood pressure um, <laughs> for for various different <laughs> reasons. Reasons. Yeah. Um, but but that comes with its with its own challenges mm-hmm. as well. And so, um, could you be a better powerlifter with lower blood pressure? Probably. Yep. Um. So, it, you know, do you have to have high blood pressure to be really strong? No. no. Um, so it, does having high blood pressure come come with health risks and, and a prep itself that, that has a, a bunch of fatigue and, and harshness on the body towards the end of it? Mm-hmm. You know, that on top of high blood pressure, is, this, is that really what we want? Yeah. If we can avoid it, which we can fairly easily, yeah. or we can at least lower it slightly... Yeah, with just a little bit of conditioning, I think it's kind of a no-brainer for me. Yeah, definitely. But this is the thing, right? Did I do it when I was powerlifting? No, <laughs> absolutely not. No, you are um, looking at the team captain and founder of Team Purple over here. Yes, I was. <laughs> I was Team Purple's le- fearless leader. Yeah. Um, but looking, so I'm. I'm speaking from, I guess, hindsight, which is easy to do. Yeah. Um. But it's something that I, I think I wish someone had have told me at the time. So mm-hmm. that's why I speak about it. Yeah. Well, and it makes you a better coach because you've learned the mistakes. You've learned the hard way. You know, like, don't do this. I've done it. Yeah. You I don't th- need to do it because I've done it. Yeah. And it's not good. So let's not go there. Yeah. Like, or it's like, you, as, a, as a coach, I think the best lessons you teach are the ones that you've personally gone through. Yeah. It's like, I've done this and I got better, so let's do that, you know. It doesn't have to just be a negative one. It can be a positive one too. Yeah, I agree. It's, and I think that's, you know, if, if there's one thing that I can say I definitely have as a coach, it's experience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, if good, good and bad. Yeah, that's it. If you didn't after as long as you've been doing it, I think you're doing something wrong. But one, one thing that I've noticed since – we became friends and just in general and watching you is that you're, you have a thirst for getting better constantly. And um, one of the things that kind of coincided with your transition to changing out of powerlifting specifically being a bit more well-rounded was education. So mm-hmm. um, you went and did the prescript course. You've done some mentorships, mm-hmm. stuff like that. That's really kind of opened up a lot of doors and, um, 
both in thinking but also professionally and out there it's got you thinking differently so can you tell me a bit about what that looked like what led you to that and why has it kind of opened up as many uh, rabbit holes of training that it has yeah definitely um thank you for noticing that and thank you for bringing that up because that actually really does mean a lot to me it's something that I don't know I don't know if it's always been a positive um that thirst for I guess never really being satisfied Mm -hmm. with with just where I'm at um it's it's definitely the reason why I'm still here doing what I'm doing it's it's definitely the reason why I, I keep looking for more but it's also been the source of Uh, a lot of doubt, uh, self-doubt, a a lot of like imposter syndrome, I Mm -hmm. guess. Um, And and just, I guess, really it's caused relationship issues and and family issues that that, like Nick's just the guy that's never satisfied. Yeah. Um, And I I think with age, I've kind of come to the point now where I I accept that I'm just never going to be satisfied with who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm going to continue to try and get better. And I think that that's a a necessary evil for me, but I also don't think that it means that I'm terrible now, if that makes sense. Definitely. Um, So... And it did in the past. Yep. <laughs> in the past, it was, I need to know more because... And because I need to know more, that means I know nothing now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's not the case now. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to say that I have a th- I do have a thirst for more, um, but I also attack everything that I do now with complete confidence and conviction in what I currently believe yep. to be true. Yeah, um, yeah so st- start of this year... Um, moved away from powerlifting, decided that I wanted to I wanted to just keep getting better. Um, coming off the back of doing the mentorship with Will, um, doing the coaching with Will, mm-hmm. I felt like I felt like I was pretty solid in my knowledge of powerlifting and my, uh, my knowledge of strength training yep. for powerlifting the sport. Um, I'd, I'd taken what I learned during that, I'd taken what I'd learned through coaching my clients through my years of doing Westside and, and all of the other things that we spoke about and, and kind of formed my own way of doing things, mm-hmm. which I was really happy with and, and got people really great results. But I felt like outside of that, there was there was probably areas that I could, that I could improve on. Um, so after some discussions with, with people that – um, I, I value their opinions. Um, I, I did enroll in Prescript earlier this year, Prescript Level 1, which is a fantastic course, um, which just goes through general applied biomechanics um, of, of strength training. Um, and it was great. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was really in-depth. I think it's four months. Uh, and, and at the end of it, you get a certificate and you, you do a test just like everything else. But the... The relationships that I guess I formed during that and the community that's involved in that was was really good. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was able to have some really good conversations with some people that, that really got me thinking about training a little bit differently. Um, jumped into to do a mentorship um, with Killian Hamilton off the back of that as well, which um, I spoke to you a little bit about yep. when when I was making that decision, which was... Honestly, one of the best decisions I think I could have made. Um, Killian, if you're not familiar with his work, definitely go and have a look. I think it's Killian.Hamilton on Instagram. Um, I have a podcast with him on on YouTube and on Spotify. Go and listen to that and, and look at his work. But he, he's a... It's a great episode, that one. Yeah, he's phenomenal. And, and the way that he thinks about... Mm movement and training and his story in general was super inspiring yep. to me um, coming from where he come from and, and me having kind of gone through the same thing of having to sleep in my car to try and make it in in the strength training world and and just getting an opportunity when I did um, I, I resonated with so 
I jumped into a, a mentorship with him, which was great. Um, and then off the back of that, um, I've, I've been able to to then take that and, and what I learned prior and then what I've done through experience. And like I said before, I've, I've kind of built this system now where I, I feel like there's no rules for me. Um, and I feel like I kind of make uh, my own rules. Mm -hmm. um, and the way I think about it is I, I'm not – I don't just do random things for the sake of random things. Mm -hmm. But if you have a really good understanding of the box, that then gives you a little bit of freedom to maybe like pop a foot outside of it every now and then. Um, because you know where you know the box you know the box very well you know all aspects of it you know what's inside it you know where the edges are and if you know where they are you can kind of pop outside it a little bit and then pop back in if you need to mm -hmm. um, so that's that's been an, a nice little creative exploration of like what boundaries can I push yeah how can I look at training a little bit differently and how can I take these qualities and how can I have an athlete ready every single week mm. to display whatever physical quality they want to display in that moment? Yeah. Um, whether that be um, coming up against a team that's, that's big. Um, so I, I need to match them strength wise and, and not get bashed but there's also an ability here for me to express my speed mm -hmm. and maybe get on the outside of them or, or you know, put some footwork on and go through them. Um, but if I've just come off a three-month strength block, I'm going to be terrible at speed. Yeah. You know, so how do we take speed, strength, endurance and how do we train those qualities every single week mm -hmm. on, uh, I guess, kind of an undulating style of training where we're not missing anything ever. Um, and then how do we layer in some resiliency work and some robustness to an athlete in these key sites to help reduce injury at the same time? Yeah. And this works for powerlifting too. Mm -hmm. you know, what, are, what are the key sites where powerlifters have injuries or overuse pains and how can we layer in some resiliency and some some technical robustness within their programming that that kind of takes care of that before it's an issue yeah um off the back of that um i started working with uh, maitland pickers as you mentioned earlier doing um taking care of the the snc for the 19s and the women's teams um mm -hmm. with them and then assisting harley um <coughs> With the, with the first grade team over there, the Denton Cup side um, yep. this year. Um, we went through pre-season um, all the way into in-season. This weekend is the last round before before we move into finals. Um, so, and that's been, that's, that's been the best thing that could have, could have ever happened to me was, yep. was finally kind of stepping back, I guess. Mm. It's like a weird way to think about it, but... Yeah, it's come back around. It's, it's full kind circle. of come full circle to where like football is what got me into training. It, it's always been my first love. Yeah. It broke my heart. I couldn't look at it anymore. I had to go and see other people. Yeah. And, you know, all the way t 20 years down the track, um, I've kind of found my way back. Mm -hmm. um, but with all of these extra tools in the tool belt to be yeah. able to help these athletes hopefully become – the athlete that I never could, yeah, um, which is which is where we're at now, um, and that that then has led me to to enrol in university, um, studying sports science, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, full time, mm -hmm. which um, keeps you busy, keeps me very very, <laughs> very 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 busy, but it's also something that I'm thoroughly enjoying now yeah. that I'm used to used to being in the, the school system, I yeah. guess, again, the formal learning system. I think that's the hardest thing when you go back to uni as someone who's done it as an adult. <laughs> it's just getting back into the that mode. 
yeah and getting your head around the the platforms which they use and yes. oh, it's just like oh my god yes so what are some of the biggest things you've noticed having to then work with athletes that need to be ready every week mm-hmm. but you need to conjugate their training to com- include all those things yep um, what are some of the biggest things that you've noticed that you have to do every week that kind of encompass every athlete? Um, so, so yeah, so it's going to be sport dependent. Yep. Um, but like I, I mentioned, the the resiliency or the technical robustness yep. stuff, and I, I think that re- regardless of the athlete, that needs to be in a program mm-hmm. in, in my perspective. Um, what that looks like will be dependent on the sport that the athlete plays and, and the key sites that we want to, um, I guess, fortify. Um, but I, I think that there, in, in any program that I ever write from now until eternity, will have a, a technical ro- robustness or, or a durability or a resilience mm. um, piece to it. Um, getting really specific with the the time that that we use in a session. Um, yep. If we have an athlete that plays on a on a Saturday. Uh, does field sessions on a Tuesday and a Thursday, works a full-time job mm. or, or, or studies full-time, whatever it may be, um, they don't necessarily have the time or the desire to spend two, three hours in a gym yeah. like a, a powerlifter loves mm-hmm. because lifting weights is the sport. Yeah. Um, so outside of that, an athlete might be like, I don't, I don't really want to spend my whole day in the gym. Um, mm-hmm. So how do we utilize the time effectively? Mm-hmm. And, and, and then everything has a place and everything has a purpose all the way down to the warm-up slash movement prep. Yep. Like what qualities are we training during that movement prep series? And how can that filter then through into the main work? And then how can the main work filter into the accessory work? How can that transfer then over to positions that they're going to hit in their sport? Mm-hmm. Um, and how can we rotate this where maybe one week uh, we're focusing on strength here in this main movement and in the secondary movement we're focusing on power and in the, yep. the third movement we're focusing on maybe more like muscular endurance or speed endurance or something along the lines and then the week after that it might flip and then it like the main might be this and this and this but yeah. we're still touching everything each week yeah um and the program doesn't necessarily need to stay the same mm-hmm um, so the program can change based on what the athlete needs yeah. it can change week on week uh and I guess the other biggest thing is um, the other biggest thing is range of motion mm-hmm. and like how does a movement look like do we do we always need to be squatting to depth yeah no you don't be, unless you're a powerlifter mm-hmm. uh, if you're a powerlifter I think you certainly should because that's your sport but if you're not a powerlifter like what what is depth yeah you know depth is just this like arbitrary thing that like that we've taken from this one sport and kind of painted every squat that everyone's ever done with the same brush when in reality like anyone that's not a power lifter like their squat doesn't have to look a certain way it's Mm -hmm. you know some weeks we might squat higher because for for whatever reason um then we might make up range in other movements I posted a thing on my Instagram the other day, trap bar deadlifting from two blocks. Yeah. The range of motion was like this much. Yeah. You know, but then the movement, the the superset movement with that was a heel elevated Hatfield safety squat bar um, Bulgarian split squat. Yeah. Where the, the my hamstring was touching my calf. Yeah. So there was plenty of range of motion in that one. Yeah. Um, so it's like, can we limit it here mm-hmm. and train this quality? And then maybe we can find range elsewhere. Yeah. Um, and this kind of ties back into that thing of there's really no rules. Yeah. You know, we, think, we make our own rules. I think that's a hard thing for when anyone kind of like a layman to strength sports or a beginner level coach or something like that. Anyone posts team training and they see this snippet of what they're doing. Like I saw some review of what the Sydney Swans were doing. And they were doing a very conjugate based you know, I think I'm doing trap bar deadlifts against chains and box mm-hmm. squats against bands and stuff like that. And yeah. I was like, oh, cool. Like, to me, I'm instantly go, oh, I know what they're doing, you know, yep. blah, blah, blah. But some people might look at it and go, what the hell are they doing trap bar deadlifts against chains for? They're not powerlifters. Or why are they doing that range of motion? Like, the argument becomes 
null and void if you don't if you're not that strength and conditioning coach that's not making those decisions of what do these people need. Yeah, uh, accommodating resistance. Oh, I love it so much. Yeah. <laughs> do you want to talk about that? Sure. I know you love it too. Right, I love it. <laughs> I just think it's <laughs> such a great tool yeah. um, for for so many different things. Um, I think it's fantastic in powerlifting. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm using it with a lot of my raw lifters at the moment and they're seeing great benefits from it. Yep. And contrary to most people's opinion, it's not just for equipped lifters. It's not for equipped lifters. It's not just to overload the top. No, no, That's no. not the point. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and that, it can be the point. Yeah, uh, but if you want it to be. Yeah, that's the thing, right? It can be for, for so many different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm using it with a lot of uh, my raw lifters. I, I would kind of put slingshot kind of in that bucket as yeah. well of like some form of um, accommodating resistance yeah. in, in the well you're changing the force velocity curve yeah. so it, it, it's the it same thing you a little bit and yeah. I would kind of bucket that in the same kind of bucket I guess mm-hmm. and I, I use that a lot but even broader to that I use it with a ton of athletes yeah. as well because um, it teaches them to move quickly yeah. it teaches them to continue to move quickly all the way until the end of the movement and mm-hmm. not just kind of do it a little bit at the start and then yeah. finish finish slow um and it's fun and it creates a lot of buy-in because like who doesn't love lifting against the bands yeah, it's, it's exciting yeah it's, <laughs> and it's cool yeah. and people like it so I, I find i get a lot of buy-in for, for things like that so i do use it a lot mm-hmm. um Oh, but funny, Sorry, funny what? story about that in the how people kind of look at bands and stuff. How a mutual friend of ours and my client Brendan, who's a strong man, I was setting up for one of my heavy squat sessions against. I think I had 120 kilos of band tension on the SSB, and he before I put any weight on it, he wanted to try what the bands were, and he stood up sat down and was stuck on the box <laughs> yeah. and could not stand up. He can deadlift 350 kilos or 320 from the floor. Yeah. As a world record axle deadlift. Like, he's not weak. Yeah, not by He could stretch. not stand up 120 kilos of band tension because he yep. didn't create tension from the beginning yep. and he got punished for it. Yeah. I had to help him up. Yep. <laughs> yeah, in terms of really forcing you to create a tight system, mm. if you don't, you're your pancaked as yeah. well you know so if you have someone struggling for tightness one of the low hanging fruit bands on the bar they have no choice yeah I, I like to use them as well of like changing the the direction of pull for a movement as well mm-hmm. you can you can band it where something's pulling you a little bit forward or yep. pulling you a little bit backwards um and that's going to change an athlete's center of mass and and how that like load moves through the movement and yep. and if you're trying to get someone to, to move a certain way that can really help as well yeah um there's lots of things that you can do that i that i really like with, with and it's fun and it's just cool <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, like do, do we really need any other reason other than it's cool yeah i yeah. don't think we do like it's I, okay to just do things because it's fun right yeah. yeah why not like that's a that's a big part of training that i think as coaches sometimes we can lose sight of mm-hmm it's okay to just do things because it's fun yeah and i think as coaches we we find that site like organizing that stuff fun like programming is fun figuring out all the shit that people need to do is fun for us but it might not be fun for them so yeah. big part of buy-in is they need to be having fun while they're training so. yeah for sure I, and yeah programming has become my creative outlet mm-hmm. uh, and that's something that i've really uh, I've really lent into over the last couple of months, especially. Yeah. Um, but I've never, I've never been a particularly creative person, and uh, and and I think the more I lean into programming as a creative outlet, the more I think that everyone has a level of creativity in them. It's just a matter of finding mm-hmm. it, their outlet for it. Yeah. Um, and I know that you're a very creative person musically mm-hmm. um, and and with videography and, and audio and, and all of the things that you do, you, you seem to me to have a very a creative flair to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've never really had that. 
um, up until recently, and and I, I started really looking at programming and and program design from a much more creative perspective. Yeah. And in doing so, I it, it, it's really it's brought a ton of enjoyment, yeah. like a, a lot of enjoyment to to my work and to the way that I program and to the way that I look at at programming and exercise and, and program design and periodization and, and all of the stuff that's involved in being a coach mm-hmm. from the, the technical side of things. Yeah. Um, it, it's more than just a science for me now. It's It really has become very creative. Yeah. Um, which well, I love. As you were explaining what you need to address through an athlete, I was – in my head thinking well any pro like just general strength training is meat and potatoes compared to what you need to do for an athlete so mm-hmm. that would be immensely creative because you're like well i'm gonna take my hockey player mm-hmm. and what's the demands of their sport and how do i need to fit that into this week what are they doing like that's exciting and i can see how that would become creative yeah and it, it does become very much uh, a, a game of of puzzle as well yeah. because it's like okay Show me what, show me what you've got from the team. Mm-hmm. Show me what you're doing here and what you're doing there. Okay, what does that, what does that load look like for for you? What does that training load look like? And mm-hmm. then, these are the qualities that that I want to help you with. This is the training load that that's going to come with. Okay, that's too much. Yeah. Okay, what do I? How can I take some of this out but still get that? And how can I mix that in with this? Yeah. And then you play on this day, so you can't train on that day can train on this day and how does that fit into a week Mm -hmm. it's kind of cool yeah yeah it's fun um do you feel more confident taking risks with this sort of stuff in terms of what you put in now that you feel like it's more of a creative process um yeah yes and no um my my training has become the testing grounds Mm -hmm. for for what gets put into athletes' programs, sure. um, so when I'm when I'm sitting down and I'm creating a program for an athlete, whether it be a powerlifter or a hockey player or a swimmer or a rock climber, I, I would never just put something in there for the sake of randomness or for mm. the sake of, oh, he's a rock climber, he needs to to do this towel pull up, whatever it is, right? There's always a, a method to the madness, and it's always something that I've done. Mm-hmm. So that I know what it feels like, so that I can demo it, because I think that's very important, and so that I I know what it feels like to do that, because then if I know what it feels like, I can then pair something off the back of that and be like, okay, if I ask him to do this and then this, I know what that's going to feel like, mm-hmm. and he's not just going to be like flogged on the ground, being like, oh, I can't believe Nick asked me to do that, <laughs> <laughs> and me just being like, oh. Okay. That was that was a, a hip dominant movement and that was a, a knee dominant movement. They should have been fine together, but in reality, yeah. never having done them, I would never know the impact that it would have on on the human doing it, yeah. or the athlete doing it. Um, so my own training has become, I guess, a testing ground. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm uh, the stuff that you see me do on Instagram, and you're like, oh, that's kind of weird. Like, why is he doing that eight second eccentric or an, or an oscillating Bulgarian split squat with yeah. his toe up or his heel up or whatever? It's because I'm thinking about okay, what quality do I do I want here? What quality do I want here? What's a way that I can, what movement can I put here that will train that quality? Mm-hmm. And then I okay, yeah, I like that or I don't like that in my own training. Now that I've kind of resided to the fact that I'm not an athlete anymore, yep. I, I'm a coach, yep. um, and that's what I that's what I do, and that's what I will do for for the rest of my life. It's really opened up a freedom in the sense that I don't have to follow a certain program. My yeah. program can be the testing ground for my athletes. Yeah. Um, and then when I'm then building out programs, I, I know how it feels. I know how it looks. It, it's been done firsthand mm-hmm. by me personally. Um, yeah. But yes, it, it has opened up a, a freedom and, and it comes back to this point of me saying that there's really no rules because because I'm so comfortable from the years and years of experience of in this field, in this field, in this field, in this field, and now having the the creativeness f- on top of that is I know where the box is, but I'm also now not afraid to just 
pain outside of it a little bit mm. because I know if I ever need to, I can go back inside it and be very comfortable. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's like Pride Rock. I can, I can go. Th- I can go to the dark place yeah. to the to the elephant graveyard. Yeah. Even though you're not supposed to, because I know how to get back. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a, and it's good because you've got that opportunity now. When we're an athlete still competing, you needed to stay somewhat in that box. Yeah, hundred percent. And like you said before, though, you can use your off seasons, especially if you're doing your own stuff, to color out lo- outside the lines a little bit. But yep. what are some of the movements that you've been surprised by that you've done you know yeah. like i'm gonna try this yeah so uh, I, <laughs> my athletes hate them <laughs> 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 but like really like really really slow eccentrics mm-hmm. um and just really leaning into that eccentric quality of the movement has been um beautifully challenging when we're talking slow eccentrics we're talking like six to ten second eccentrics yeah you know, like 10 second eccentric squats is, is something that I've been known to give people recently. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when, when you do a proper 10 second eccentric squat, like that's a hell of a long eccentric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And, and you, do a, you do a set of that and you start to, you start to feel it. Mm-hmm. Or like, um, you know, like a, a really slow, like a 10 second eccentric Bulgarian split squat. Yeah. Which is if Bulgarian split squats couldn't be any worse. They trust me, they can be. <laughs> um, so like next time someone complains about how bad they are, I'm like, look, I can make them a hell of a lot worse if you trust like. Trust me, they can, they can be way worse. Yeah. So, yeah, leaning into the, those east slow, really slow mm. eccentrics has been fun. What's um, the biggest benefit you've seen in those? So the way the way I like to to look at things is if we if we look at the the eccentric portion of a movement as the the strength mm-hmm. dominant portion of the movement and the concentric portion of the movement as the power dominant yep. portion of the movement, um, if we say load a movement um, and, and just do both uh, for a certain amount of reps, we're kind of underloading one of them uh, to, mm-hmm. to do the other. Um, so we're not getting the full benefit of an eccentric because we had to load it so that we could do the, the concentric yeah. per se, sure. right? So if I take something like uh, a single leg uh, landmine RDL mm-hmm. where you stand up with two feet and then you lift one foot off the ground and you do a, a six to, to ten second eccentric to where the, the plate lands back on the ground and then you put that foot down, lift it back up, do another slow eccentric. Mm. Essentially what you're doing is you're overloading that eccentric portion of the movement or the strength portion of the movement mm. and really lending or allowing yourself the ability to lean into that strength portion of the movement, which I've found really beneficial. Yeah. And then likewise on the concentric side of the equation is, okay, can we do like banded bench press off pins where we take out the eccentric portion of the movement and just solely focus on the concentric power dominant um, part of that that force velocity curve that we're looking at can we lean into that quality and can we get all of the benefit out of that portion of the movement the answer is yes we Mm can um and, and it's it's fun it's fun to train like that so some of the programming that i've been doing at the moment might be like a lower body eccentric dominant day or a lower body concentric dominant day sure, okay. or looking at things like can we can we pair or contrast a eccentric dominant movement with a concentric dominant movement yeah. and get both qualities but break it up into two separate movements yeah so something so like, like you were doing with the trap bar off the blocks into the split squat like i was doing with yeah. the trap bar off the blocks or you know like like m at the moment it really wants to um get really good at pull-ups yep it's something that she's had a goal for a long time and she's gone away from it every now and then but she always kind of comes back to this goal three or four times during during our relationship where she's like i really just i want you to get me to do a lot of pull-ups yeah i'm like we obviously really want to do this because it's something that you've mentioned a bunch of times so Mm -hmm. like let's do that 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 could be fun so in her programming she'll have a concentric dominant press movement Mm -hmm. paired with or contrasted with 
an, an eccentric only chin up. Yeah, okay. Where it's like weighted. Yep. And she jumps to the top and does like a six second eccentric yeah. with weight hanging off her. And that, that, like I said, that's paired with, say, like a, um, a concentric only pressing movement. But I think at the moment it's paired with a landmine press, yeah. a, a split stance landmine yeah. press. Where it's so ultimately what ends up happening is she's adequately loading both portions of the same movement by doing two movements. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's why it's it's fun to watch your Instagram at the moment. Yeah. She might she might pair it with like Penley Rose or yeah. something that's like concentric. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then the the second day within the second upper body day that she does is a concentric only pull up mm-hmm. paired with an eccentric movement as the the A two. Yeah. Okay. Say. Yeah. Um, so. You're getting the complete picture, but you're loading both parts of that equation effectively yeah. and efficiently. It's almost like a, um, a deconstructed accommodating resistance, almost. Like you're flattening the, the strength curve or more kind of properly, you're, you're adequately allocating the strength curve to the movement over two movements. Mm-hmm. So that's a... It's an interesting way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, it's like why do one, why do one at like and get seventy five percent of the benefits when you yeah. can just do two and get a hundred percent? Yeah, yeah. And so, do so then you'll bring it together for her to do pull ups. Yeah, and and can she do more pull ups now? Absolutely. I think I think I shared a story just before I walked in here of her doing like two sets of three unassisted pull ups, which yeah, right. awesome. is is not. Like world beating by any stretch, but it's three more than what she could do six weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and so that's great. Yeah, um, that tells me what we're doing is is moving in the right direction, and yeah. it doesn't have to be done like that all of the time, and and it never nothing ever is all of the time. Yeah, but it's definitely something that I'm I'm really enjoying the process of of figuring out mm-hmm. and and experimenting with and yeah. and seeing the results of because. Yeah, it's quite fun. You know, those those uh, banded uh, Anderson squats that you were telling me about was that was that was one of those things. That was a concentric, yep. dominant squat pattern. Yeah, because on the eccentric, you're just dropping it back to the pins. Just dropping it back to the pins, mm. and I, I think from memory, I paired that actually with a, an oscillating Bulgarian split squat. Yeah, which was gross. Uh, Ball of ball of my foot yeah. in the bottom position, oscillating in and out of the in and out of that bottom position for thirty seconds, yeah, yeah. which was horrible. Yeah, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it sounds it. Well, if you don't know what that means, go over to Nick's Instagram and have a look because it's a wealth of interesting. Like you've always put out interesting stuff, but at the moment, particularly, I think for the the paradigm of what training looks like in Australia, it's, it's you know, or the upper echelons of what you're pushing. It's very interesting. So, Thanks, mate. I appreciate that. Social media is uh, something that I, I don't overly feel comfortable with mm-hmm. uh, and never have, and I've kind of resided to the fact that I never will yeah. feel overly comfortable with it. But I, I think I'm – I think I've figured out that – it's okay. I'm I'm quite comfortable with what I'm doing, and I'm quite comfortable yeah. with what I believe, and I quite I'm quite comfortable with uh, with my knowledge and and my application. And if I just show that, it, it's okay if other people on the internet don't agree. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm still going to do it. Yeah. And so that's kind of the point I'm at now, where it is uh, I'm just using that platform and i'm not sure if you've noticed but i'm just using that platform to showcase what i'm doing Mm -hmm. and what i'm doing with my athletes and what i'm doing with myself yeah and if someone out there happens to to find it educational or or interesting Mm. so be it that that's fantastic but um at the end of the day I, I don't really mind if people agree or disagree Mm. because i'm I'm still going to do it which is a contrast to what say even six months eight months ago what you're doing it was a lot more kind of hey how this is how we can do this now it's just like hey this is what i'm doing yeah like it or leave it yeah and i i think that comes with 
with age a little bit mm-hmm. too and experience, doesn't it? I yeah. mean, you and I have had so many conversations oh, yeah. where it's like, I don't want to put this out there because what if someone says it's wrong? Yeah. Uh, and and you know what if I get what if I get judged on on Instagram? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that's the position that so many people are in, especially in in our industry and yeah. in in twenty twenty four where it's everyone has an opinion on Instagram and mm-hmm. good or bad, it, it doesn't really matter. It's that they have the right to to put it out there. Yeah. Um. And, and I think. It's so easy to to go into that and, and try, I guess, try and not copy everyone else, but almost like, well, if I do this, that a lot of other people are doing that, so maybe I won't get ridiculed because mm. it, it's kind of like the way things are done. Yeah. Um, and it's I safe know content. It's safe, right? Yeah. No one's going to judge you because the guy that has 100,000 followers does that or 2 million followers does yeah. that. And like if he does it, it must be okay because yeah. he has a lot of followers. So if yeah, I do yeah. it, maybe people won't won't, won't judge me. Um, and I, I know I fell into that trap a little bit, and I mm-hmm. think a lot of people do. Um, but it just didn't feel authentic to me trying to to do what other people were mm-hmm. doing just because they were doing it. Well, I think one of the things that our mutual friend Annie said to me, particularly, but I think shout she out said, Annie. yeah, shout out to Annie Short. Um, was make content that you're comfortable making, whatever that looks like. Yep. If you're comfortable talking to a camera, make that because yep. it's going to be easy content for you to make. So, but then I'd take it a step further and say that I need to be comfortable making it, and it needs to align with my values as a coach. Yep. I'm not going to put it out just because it's. And this is something we've had many uh, lengthy conversations about. Is just like finding that what sits well within your values as a coach to put out into the world and you know yeah. i've found my niche of what i do and, and whether it works person. or it doesn't it doesn't whatever and, and, and as a person yeah right like you, i think your values as a coach and as a person are both very very important in, mm. in how you show up well they should be the same i think well they are one <laughs> the same aren't yeah. they <laughs> if you're like your you, how you coach is completely different to how you are as a person, then that is like there's a dissonance there, and you're gonna have things like where your reputation gets around that you're a shit dude. Yeah, yeah. And, or or even even beyond that, like it, it it might not even necessarily be that you're a bad person, but yeah. if your if you your personal values are one thing, and your how you conduct your business or, or yourself in business is mm. a completely different thing. From a personal perspective, at some point there's going to become misalignment yeah. in how you feel. Um, and I know that I've I've felt that yeah. myself in in um, throughout certain times of, of my life and, and even even as of recently is is uh, you know taking stock of like who I am as a person and then is that how I'm showing up mm. in my business yeah. is that how I'm showing up on the internet is that how I'm showing up in conversations or is this or am I just saying this yeah. is how I am as a person but I'm not actually being that person yeah, you're not doing it yeah the actions so, actions don't align yeah so I think it, even from from a personal perspective, I think that yeah. that there needs to be alignment. Otherwise, at some point, the, the things will unravel yeah. for yourself. So, to wrap things up a little bit, what's the best way to get in contact with you? And Are we at time already. Yeah, it's easy, just like that. Man, I'm sitting here. I could talk to you all day, but that camera's going to run out of data soon. <laughs> <laughs> that has flown by. Yeah, if if anyone is interested in in getting on in contact or just just kind of following along the journey, I guess. Um, Instagram is probably the place to yep. to see the stuff um, that's recently been changed. That's now at Coach, uh, aka Coach Nick. Big's gone. Big's gone. I'm still slightly big, but I, I saw I, it change and I was like, oh, yeah. A part of me was sad. Yeah, it's like you're big, Nick. What yeah, it's it's You're actually still fucking big. It's actually only the third change I've ever made on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, right. The third name change. It started out as the Yank Tank. Yep. Uh, and then it was AKA Big Nick, and and now it's AKA Coach Nick. So, 
um, aka Coach Nick on Instagram, NZ underscore athletics on, on Instagram is the, the business name, um, the business page, uh, which there's there's a ton of great content on there as well. Lots of nutrition advice. Lots of nutri- yeah, so, so M collabs that page as well. I collab that page. We both create, I, I guess you could call it create content for that page, um, but it is a good resource for anyone that's interested in in sports nutrition or in or in strength and conditioning training, mm-hmm. um, they're, they're the, the places to find me. Awesome. Well, I thank you for coming on. I've enjoyed chatting to you, as I always enjoy chatting to you. Thanks, Ben. And I miss you around the gym. Yeah, I miss you too, buddy. I, I <laughs> Like I said at the start, uh, and I am going to say it again because I want to say it more than one time, I, I <laughs> really, 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 really wholeheartedly appreciate you having me on. This has been so enjoyable um and and i hope we can do more of it Uh, and i think you're doing such a fantastic job here with this podcast and it's it's literally a a massive honor and a pleasure for me to to be invited on and and have a chat with you so thank you very much you are most welcome and the feeling's mutual (laughs) thanks for watching thanks for listening uh you can find us on youtube spotify like subscribe all of that technical business and we'll see you next time thanks for tuning in